I want to start off with like just telling you huge fan of Thanks. your work, by the way. Thank like you very so much. total fanboying out here. Like I quite honestly, I was down in the kitchen talking to my wife and I'm like, I don't believe I'm talking to the guy who quite honestly, like your work in the early days, so let's say late eighties, early nineties, were the influential images that like influenced me as an artist like i oh. saw your stuff rolling stones like all the different stuff all around sorry rolling stone magazine not yeah. the rolling stones not the rolling stone. yeah. i had experience with two but not the whole so it's like yeah <laughs> but yeah I, I mean i've known your work and like watched your career for decades so it's quite a sort of honor to be here and i'm a little nervous Thanks. so bear with me yeah. we seem to be the same age maybe i don't know maybe i'm a little older i guess I think you're a little older. I'm 48. Oh, okay, yeah. I, I just oh, you're look right. Yeah. Older. You know, it's 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 all the gray around you. Maybe you're in a gray room, so it's it's absorbing onto you. So. Uh. <laughs> oh no, no, it's gray. It, it's, it's gray. It, it's all yeah. It's all gray. I just I just you. keep it short, so I don't have to think about the grays. It just keeps my wife just keeps cutting it down, but the beard doesn't. Beard gives it away. So it's uh, yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's sad but true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah, that's a, that was a very interesting time of my life. So it was a, a very, that time frame is very different than what it is now to be a photographer. I kind of laugh when I see a lot of that. Like when I see people out there working and, and trying to get started. And and even I was watching a, a Harry Benson documentary the other day. And I said to my wife, I said, that doesn't exist anymore. His whole career and how he did things and how he embedded himself with people is just, I mean, I remember coming in just at the end of that and then all of a sudden having everything just get just like slapped, like everything became like this wall of for photographers to cross over. And I just, it's, it's very interesting. So, you know. Well, I actually, I would love to hear about that because that's actually sort of one of my things that I'm interested in. By the way, just as a background, I'm a photographer also and a professor at this point in my life. So like, so I'm still involved in it, though I'm not anywhere near as involved as you are at this point. I've been lucky to hold on to my career since a lot of friends have kind of, I, and I don't know why it is. I mean, maybe it's just, someone told me that it was, that it's the constant evolution. It's, I'm, I'm such an ADD kid that I, uh, and my uh, rep used to make fun of me for this, that I would get excited about something. I would shoot with a certain kind of light or a certain kind of camera. And then I would go through this process and it would be kind of funny. Either she would say, you've done it enough. You need to kind of figure something else out because now you're beating this to death. Or I would just all of a sudden appear one day with this. You know what I mean? And she, so she was always, Carol, Carol was always very, Carol of has been my agent for almost 30 years. She's been the only agent I've ever had, which is kind of a mark in, in most photographers career. They've stuck with the same agent. But she also saw a lot in my early life and, and, and gave me the opportunities and kind of got me through a lot of it and, and saying, this is where you need to go. This is what you should do. You know, let's try this, you know, supportive in every aspect, even becoming a director for a while where there was no financial gain on that end. It was all of a sudden she just said, go do it. You know, a lot of the artwork she has nothing to do with, but she's tremendously supportive of it. Having an agent like that in my life has been very supportive. So, you know, in doing things. But yeah, I don't, I don't know where I was going with that. But <laughs> we were talking about sort of the changes in the industry. Yeah. And it's just, you know, when I started out, you basically would drop your portfolio off at magazines to get into the magazines because that's where you started your career. And you did quarter page pictures for people. And and then you hope to get a, a half a page. Then you hope to get a full page. And then, oh, my God, to get the cover, you know, is like, you know, that's when you knew you kind of somewhat made it. And I have to say, and then there'll be things where people come to you and say, if you don't do this for us, this will be so good for your career, which has always been like, the minute you say it to me, I go, oh, okay, I'm not interested. Because it's such a bullshit statement to say to a photographer because nothing is ever, there is no rhyme or reason of why any of us become successful. It's just suddenly somebody says, I'll give you a chance. I'll do this. I'll do that. And I would say the only things in my life that were things that, basically were were the things that defined me were the things that basically kind of said people kind of took notice to were working for rolling stone back in the day because i was doing quarter page pictures here and there and then all of a sudden i got a you know a double page spread just by accident they sent me to shoot a quarter page spread of, of tracy chapman and her album burst and all of a sudden they had to do a feature on her 
And I was the one that happened to go shoot her by myself with a bag of cameras, no publicist, no hair and makeup. She and I went for a walk with her dog. That was the shoot. You know what I mean? I flew up to Boston by myself. That's what it was. That's a very different experience than what it is now. I mean, where most photographers don't get a chance to, you know, just show up to some musician's house and say, I'm here to take your picture. There's, there's so many barriers to jump over and, you know, who's doing hair and makeup and what are you going to do? And what are your ideas? And it's like, I just love the opportunity back in the day just to find something with somebody. And I wasn't so structured as, as most of my, my friends, they were much more of the Annie Leibovitz days where, you know, they had the big light and they had the idea and they were like, you know, you're the sausage king of California. So I'm going to cover you in sausages. Or I just, that wasn't my brain at all. And I, I remember trying a couple of those and failing miserably at it because I, it just wasn't who I was. And I kind of loved the moment that I would have, if I was to do your portrait, I would show up and this is the moment I've been given. This is what we're doing. This is what's happening. The idea of prepping and having an idea to show up to someone's house sometimes was, was completely depressing because you get there and nothing you thought was going to be there. And then you're so focused on this idea of how you perceive the person or what you want to do, that you forget to take the moment and, and accept the moment that's being given, this piece of light that's coming in the room or a situation that you walk into. So, you know, so I got, you know, I, I kind of was the guy they always sent when there was 10 minutes to shoot somebody, which I kind of loved that in the aspect that it was, that it was either you were going to fail miserably or you were going to basically rise above and come away with something that nobody else got because that was it. You know what I mean? That's all you could do. So I kind of, I kind of, you know, started really getting off on that, you know, where it was just, you know, and you could use it as an excuse when someone said, well, is there anything else? Well, no, I only had 10 minutes. So this is the picture. You know what I mean? Here's, here's the image, you know, or here's five pictures because I only shot a roll of film. You know what I mean? And, instead of shooting a hundred rolls of film or whatever, which drove photo editors crazy, probably didn't make me a lot of friends, but, but so working for Rolling Stone was one big jump in my life. And then I would say the second one was David Bowie. And it, and it, and it's, and it's just the sheer point of my arrogance and my innocence of photographing him for the first time. And my whole thing of always trying new things and not really, you know, just thinking like, well, so if I fail and no one ever hires me again or this client never hires me again, uh, I guess I'll just move on to the next thing. It was just, I didn't have kids. I didn't have a wife. I didn't have any kind of overhead. It was just me. And I kept that career. I mean, I kept that idea for late into my thirties where I was never really worrying about to maintain a studio or to maintain people in my life. My assistants were all freelance. You know, I had a studio manager, but you know, she was ready to walk at any point, you know, if I wanted to stop. So it was all, we were all kind of on the same page, but in shooting David, it was like, you know, four other photographers shot that day. I mean, three of the photographers shot that day. I was the fourth of the day. And, and I just happened to look at him and he walked in and I kind of knew what the other guys did. I knew them. And he kind of walked in and I just had a flashlight and he was like, what are you going to do? And I said, well, if you all take off your shirts and you stand here, I'm going to paint you with this flashlight. And David just looked at me and he goes, show me a Polaroid. So and it was with tin machine, so it wasn't just him. So I shot the Polaroid, and he said, you win. This is the weirdest thing I have done in a while. He goes, go ahead, do the picture. You know, and then that started a relationship of 10, you know, 15 photo shoots with him over a nine-year period and, you know, getting the call. So that relationship where if David were to choose you and pick you, being one of the most creative probably humans that ever walked the planet, I would say between music and his art was unbelievable. His writings, his, his outlook on life, how he saw things, you know, it was fascinating. And, and a lot of that came from being on shoots with him and he would sit at lunch and he'd talk to my assistants, which would freak them out. You know I mean? You sit there and all of a sudden David would go like, what are you listening to? Where'd you see lately? He, he just wants to absorb everything new, what's going on. He wanted to keep this, you know, constantly keeping going, you know, forward. At the same point, when any time I photographed him, he would never say to me, like, this is the idea. He'd just say, this is the concept. Like, this is what these pictures are for, take pictures. He never said, you know, I need this. You know what I mean? And I, that, that was unnerving, but at the same point, amazing. So I could just play with ideas and I would show him things. And he was obsessed 
like I was keeping these journals at the time and he just would sit down and start going through the journals and looking at it. He liked that I wrote backwards and he liked all the textures and he was really, you know, very supportive of that. So there was a lot of little like, you know, helpful pushes to me from people, especially with him. And everyone has that in their life. I mean, if you basically become at some point as a photographer, you'll get somebody who will basically say, okay, you're it. Hopefully. Uh, yeah, hopefully you find you hopefully, and then you can have that, and then one day the phone stopped ringing. I've had several times with people with actors that I've worked with that I was the one, and all of a sudden it was like phone stopped ringing. Clients the same way you 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 restructure a whole way a network may look at something or how they may do things or how they approach things, and and you do everything, and all of a sudden the next day you do nothing, and you have to kind of just kind of go like, okay, what's next? You know, it's like just keep that kind of what's and not backpedal and try to satisfy somebody else it's the constant trying to satisfy self and not trying to you know well if i structure my work this way maybe they'll hire me again well that's not why they hired you in the first place they hired you because you were so off the cuff or whatever well, I mean, the work that i saw of yours in your youth or in my youth i guess that was so off the wall for its time that I always looked at it as like, oh my God, they had sort of got this artist to do these assignments. And so, <laughs> you know, it's so like what I'm always, what I'm fascinated by about you is like, like I've, because I've also watched videos of you. I know your journals. I know all the sort of large spectrum of your works. I'm sort of wondering why it took so long for you to be, because like, from what I understand, your first art, quote unquote, like art exhibition was just in the past couple of years. Yeah. Well, I've had a couple of galleries, some galleries that saw that in a certain way and they, they tried it and they tried to put me on the wall, which was very kind to them. There was a Black Eye Gallery in Australia and Sydney. There was Icon, which is a photo lab here there were two ladies who tried to put a uh, exhibition in the front and everyone thought I just was an installation because the way I did it. A friend of mine at Film Solutions, Bonnie, she was given space at Photo LA one year and she let me do whatever I wanted. And she pushed me to take what I was doing on small pieces and make them large. And she helped me print big images and then I tore them up and I drew on them. And then, you know, we went to Photo LA with that. And it was a huge success. And, and that kind of, suddenly got me thinking about stuff and but none of this i i i see myself as just constantly the pro of, of going through process and i to define myself as saying all of a sudden i'm going to say like that i understood why i wasn't big i understood why i wasn't tremendously successful when i was younger because the the industry needs to have consistency and i'm i've never been consistent in in the sense of of doing I can I'm, I'm I love solving problems and the industry now has come to that suddenly where and in the in the entertainment industry has come to the point where they want you to solve problems you're going to shoot a beauty light you're going to shoot a hard light you're going to shoot something really dark and moody can you get me one guy who can do all that and suddenly here I am so I, I in my late days in my 60s now running around I can do a lot of things. I don't just have one idea. I have a million ideas. I get called in to sit and read scripts and come up with ideas and work with ad agencies and design firms to do that. I don't get paid to do that, but it's all part of getting the job now. And I enjoy that. So, cause it's, it's just what that is. And I, I mean, I just think it's a very different world now and trying to, to do work. So to see myself as an artist is an interesting concept. I say it because people now it's like, because there's my art, which is realistically no different than almost a lot of my work because it all overflows. And if I, if I do something that's normal, I end up tearing it up and making it into something, into a journal or doing something else. And I, I constantly try to challenge myself. What's next? What's next? What's next? So I'm trying, I'm always looking for new things to try. And I've been given those gifts in the sense of starting out shooting Chrome back in the day when we all shot slide and you had to really know the exposure and really know what the hell you were doing. And then we went to negative. And then there was that little like, well, with negative, you can kind of get away with a lot of shit because, you know, we can fix it in, in the processing and now digital, but digital now allows you to stand in a dark room and take a picture, you know, or use lighting that you could never use before or, and it's a very, I love that 
these things have been given in my life, you know, I've, I've enjoyed the technology kind of changing every single time. And then I have to reinvent myself. I have to think of new ways to do things. I have to take old processes and apply them to new cameras. You know I mean? Can I do this, this, and this? So I kind of enjoy the constantly being, okay, you have this, now you don't have it. You have this, now you don't have this. Okay, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna get back here? And then, and then the journey coming back has been really exciting because you'll learn new things on the way back up the ladder to get there. But again, back to the art thing is like, I didn't create art for art's sake. I created, I created what I create to basically to satisfy something that I needed to say. And a lot of people look at my journals and they say that, you know, a lot of journals are a very similar theme. My journals jump all over the place. And it's because of what I experience, what I see, what I find. It could be anything from I've torn pieces off walls in, in cities that I've traveled. My assistants always make fun because they know if we're walking back from dinner and there's a piece of paper falling off a wall in a city, I will definitely pull huge sheets off and put them under my arm. You know, and then when we go back, you know, we're stuffing them into the bags of my equipment to get them home. So I have boxes of these, you know, paper that I find, and then even little stickers and things. They, they, they will, they think it's very funny. I mean, they, you know, George Romero has been my assistant for quite a few years. And, you know, he even will turn sometimes to go, did you see this? And then he'll like, he'll point in case I missed it, you know, like, I'll be like, oh my God, you know, and we used to carry a putty knife to strip things off of walls back in the day, but we've, it got taken away from us in an airport. So we, <laughs> so, but I mean, it's, it's the art thing is that it, it just, it just happened. I started doing stuff and I started, I don't know if it was just not out of boredom, but just out of what's next, what's next. I've taken this portrait. I've taken these pictures. Oh, if I do this, if I do this, if I draw on it here, if I, if I glue it into a book and then I start writing something on it, you know, it's just, it's a next level of where it can go, where it can go. Pictures are being, reimagined now that I took 20 years ago that I'll find a box of prints and then I just start playing around with them and that's okay because it's maybe at the time I took it 20 years ago I didn't know why I took it now I know why I took it you know what I mean it's just you have to kind of accept that journey and not dismiss it to a certain extent. so you know yeah so I mean I mean people I don't know I think people were as people still are confused by me I think they're I mean my agent has a hell of a time. I, I'm not big in the advertising world because they need a consistency. I, I, if I've done six advertising jobs in my career, that'd be probably a lot. On, the only one that's ever really embraced it to the point where they really basically took the pill kind of thing and, and you know went down the slide with me was I did a Hennessy campaign years ago to find your wild rabbit and they had one they would come in with an idea and i would hand them six more in the middle of the photo shoot and they and they let me go they didn't they didn't say oh no 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 we can't do that they said where else you got you know what i mean and then they and they embraced it and they supported me it was amazing and i got to shoot like you know erica badu and manny pacquiao and like you know and uh, martin scorsese and you know nas i mean those are the people they gave me to shoot and and each person came and played with me and did it you know, and it was amazing. And then not knowing anything about how that all worked out, I went back and, and it was a huge success for me because financially, because I didn't realize that I thought, you know, I was in the world, you take pictures, they're theirs. That's just how it worked. You know, no, 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 no. They have to come back. And my agent is like laughing. She goes, you didn't get it because you, you're only supposed to shoot two things. You shot six. And now they're interested in getting the six and they weren't part of the original deal. And it's all of a sudden you're going like, holy shit. I mean, you know, it just wasn't my brain and how I did things. I was the world of music where you shot 15 ideas in a day and they used them for either marketing or for press or for album cover or for whatever they wanted to do, you know? And, and that was great because then you'd see your pictures out there and they'd use everything. So, yeah. You're a great inspiration to me. Like to me, you have taken the ability to like ride that fine line that most whatever commercial artist or fine artists or photographers, whatever, always hope to do, which is you, you have the skill set to be able to do commercial work and things like this. And you're also, you know, making very creative artistic things as well. And oftentimes 
people who are accepted in the commercial industry like aren't accepted in the fine arts industry and vice versa. Yeah. But yet you've been able to pull that off somehow that is sort of very envious. It's a tightrope. I walk every <laughs> I walk that rope and every day I could fall. I mean I'm and I and I think it's it's funny because you know I live so close to Las Vegas and everyone goes like do you ever go to Vegas? And I go Every day is Vegas to me in my life. I mean, every day is not knowing if someone's going to call me to do the next thing or, or being on a job and taking a chance that, that, you know, pushing an idea and saying, we shouldn't really do it this way. You know, it's kind of like, you know, and they and they go, really? And you're like, yeah, be really, you know, and then buying off on it, but knowing that you got to cover them just in case everything falls around you, you got to make sure they're okay. So, I mean, when I teach, I teach once a year at Palm Strings Photo Festival. And it's funny, it's the guy who runs it is a guy named Jeff Dunis. And I worked for Jeff as an assistant when I was a kid. And he was one of my main, like when I first saw him working and I saw how crazy he was and how he lit things and did things, that was a huge inspiration to me. And realizing as I grew as a photographer to inspire is much more interesting than to be successful. I think the point of when people say to you, like, it's even better than money, I have to say, because when you meet people and you've actually inspired them to do something to change the way they look at things is it's just the little steps around you to basically make the world of more of an open a mind about seeing things so when i teach i always say this is about inspiration this is about if you can inspire somebody and you go out you take what you what i'm teaching you here which is just opening your head up i'm not teaching you anything that you don't know i'm just giving you the place to come and basically allow yourself to fail or try without any kind of judgment, that's a huge part of being an artist because, you know, it's like, what's the famous words of Richard Serra, art is purposefully useless, you know, which is, is, is true. It's like you, you're, if, you know, people look at things, you always know the stuff that people try too hard doing, you know what I mean? You can go to a museum or a gallery and go, you're trying too hard. And then you look over and you see something and you go, where did that come from? And it and it's not something you just walk past. You have you stop and you start looking at all the little pieces, you know, through it and go like, holy, this is just this is this because this person had to get it out of their head, and they didn't make it for you. They didn't make it for anybody but themselves. And that that image and that piece of art is so much more fascinating than someone trying to manufacture something because they know you're going to like it. You know what I mean? It's like music. It's, it's, it's television. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's any of the arts that I've kind of looked at. I mean, you know, whatever to get people interested, if they need to have something handed to them, that's basically that's, that's comfortable. I like the idea that my, that my work is uncomfortable. I mean, my book has been, you know, it's funny when I give it to friends or, people asked to buy it. I said yeah just be conscious when you look at it some of it's not you're not going to like some of it or you're going to be disturbed by some of it or if you don't get the humor behind it I have a very dark sense of humor and and then some of it's very sexual humor you know it's just because I think it's funny I make fun of myself in the sense of that you know you know it's like the big la the big fat man walking around with a tiny penis is the is is always my ongoing joke with myself and because I just I just think it's funny to make fun of yourself or make fun of the idea of what sexuality is that, you know, that you look at all this because we are presented that in our society, all this, this overt sexuality, and then not basically reacting to it. Now being a 61 year old white male is an interesting conversation in itself. And then checking back on, you know, backing on your past and looking at the book. And, and even when the book came out, it was the start of me too. So my wife even looked at me and she said, are you ready for the question? It's just in case you're sitting in a room and somebody actually says to you, how do you, do you feel you objectify women? Which is, you know, which would be the question of if you shot a nude or if you shot, because at that time they were talking about taking nudes out of galleries, out of museums, out of paintings. And, and I was going like, stop, stop for a second. There's a history to this. There's a beauty to things. You can't let the few basically talk for the men, you know, for so many, it's like, there has to be more of a conversation and why you did something. And if you want to know why I did something in my book, I would describe it to you. I would talk to you about it. I would want, I want to hear what you, what you, how you took away from it, but I'd also want to hear you understand and say, yes, I understand why you did that. I get it. It's not my thing. That's fine. But just to dismiss something without seeing sometimes is, 
is really sad. You know, it's like, I don't know. I feel like that's where we've all gone lately, but. <laughs> I agree. It is sort of the trend of the, the current society, unfortunately. But yeah. did you get any pushback on, on the I book? didn't. I, funny is I, no one, no one. I mean, it's funny because when I did the Photografiska exhibition in Stockholm, and it's traveling. It's, it's got five years. They have the whole show for five years and they're going to travel it around to all their different facilities they have and be opening up more. And I said, they're welcome to keep traveling if they want to. But there was a, a certain conversation about how much nudity, how much, you know, like certain ones that were too much, which is interesting because I would have thought that of any place they would have been the least. But I think they were thinking ahead of where it might go. So and I was like, and, th and that's fine. It wasn't like anything got lost in the show. You know what I mean? There's nothing in the show. It's not watered down. It's not, you know, it's not in any kind of way kind of like sterilized at all. There's just a couple pieces they were like, eh, maybe we shouldn't put those in. And I was like, okay, you know. And I play a little game with them sometimes where they would say, we can't have this. And I give it, I go, how about this? It would be something that was completely even worse. <laughs> I was using the guys from South Park, you know, Trey Parker. And, and they, they basically at one point handed a movie and everyone freaked out. So they basically went to the complete extreme of how, how far they could push them, knowing that they would then get back to where they wanted to go. It's always fun to kind of do that with things. But doing the book had no, no, there was nothing. The Tanois said nothing to me about content they just said and and in fact came up with the idea for the cardboard cover to be to make it more like my journals that was their one ask they said we really think this book needs this cover because if it's too pretty it doesn't make sense to the work and i mean and it's at that book at every stage had people stepping in with the perfect solutions like david fahey and Nick Fahey basically having the idea to do the book, which 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 was not my idea, it was there. They I went in and saw them and they said we should do a book. And then then they ended up, I gave them, they weren't sure what they were even gonna look at. And I gave them like five body, you know, four bodies of work with like thousands of images. And they went through everything. And then I showed up one day and I really thought they were gonna pick one idea. And then they ended up combining all the ideas. And then they, and they laid it out and they said, this, here's five pages toward the conversation. And I said, holy shit, you get it. I mean, it's like amazing when somebody actually takes your work and can actually formulate it and doesn't try to basically, you know, water it down or, and, and then got the humor of it, you know, and David Fahey was the one that came up with the idea that it was called volume three to confuse people to say like, where's one and two, <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's totally my sense of humor. And then three, everything became threes because being Frank Ockenfell's three, we put threes through things. And it was like all these little wonderful Easter eggs we would throw around in doing the book. And so I went back and I laid the rest of the book out in the idea going like, okay, I got it. This is a great way. That collaboration enhanced like the whole experience of doing the book. And then, then Tenoise going and then making a little movie to sell it to get someone to want to publish it was great you know and and just the whole thing every step of the way we've been able to kind of like have fun doing it so each part has been a creative process each part has been a collaboration between you know everything down to the point of a friend of mine who designed the book Beth Middleworth she you know we would talk about the little weird little things of where to put page numbers or you know like or like how, how much do you want it to be here or how much do you want it to be there they're all little subtle things if you are open to it. It can't just be the one voice. I've never been happy at just being, I mean, when I'm doing my journals and that, that's me. But I love the collaboration aspect of where I've become as a photographer, where I'm working with young art directors or older art directors or people that have no creative background but want to hear where we can go with things. I think that's a lot of fun because sometimes the uneducated mind will say things to me of, you know, in the arts will say things and go like, that's right. That's what this is. That's not this. You know what I mean? Because a lot of times people in the arts overthink the shit out of stuff. You know, I mean, they've, they, and, or they've been sitting in rooms and been beaten down so badly that they're terrified to actually jump off the cliff with you. But if you get somebody who's not, they're just thinking in the way and they're going like, oh, let's try that. Yeah. It's like, well, let's go here. And they go like, yeah, let's go there. It's like, or what if we, you know, look, did you look left? And I was looking right. And they go, holy shit, left was better than right. You're right. I can go look over there. Being open to that collaboration constantly is exciting to me and probably 
is why I, I I'm still excited doing what I do. Well, that's a big like misunderstanding that a lot of young photographers and even I did in my youth. We, we thought we were the solo artist in our studios or on location, like shooting and like you know uh, you know the, the romantic idea of toiling and all this kind of crap. The reality is is that like all of this kind of stuff is collaborative, and and I yeah. wish I had been taught that early on i was not taught that because i'm one of those horrible people that like did all my full academic things all the way up to an mfa and everything and not one of my teachers ever taught me that kind of the idea of being collaborative there's so much ego and ego is only good if it's basically just to keep you going in a direction that you that you understand what you're doing is good beyond that point your ego is like you know you know i'm a carpenter and I basically build things for a living. You know what I mean? And carpenters aren't paid a lot of things. You know, I'm a plumber. I can get the things from point A to point B and I can do it creatively or I can do it very basically. You know, it's like we are luckily that lucky in the, in the craft that we have, have chosen to do in photography that it is considered a little higher art that you can get paid a little more to do it. You hope. <laughs> Not anymore. Everyone thinks nowadays that everyone can take pictures, but that's that's fine. You know, and that's, you know, that's the whole in, influx of people all of a sudden hiring Instagram photographers to do advertising campaigns and going like, OK, you know, well, you know, you, you and then people think they're, everyone's just throwing shit at a wall at this point, trying to figure out what's next, what's next instead of allowing things sometimes just to be the, you know, even with filmmaking and, and photography and, and anything like any creative industry, it's like, there's a reason that someone like myself has done this for so long and what I bring to the table. And if I have to describe that to somebody of like, well, what are you bringing that's different than what this young guy is bringing? And why would we pay you this to do this? Or why would we, you know, why would we hire you over someone else? And I'm like, well, you know, I, I, if I have to explain that to you, then it's not going to make any sense to you. You know, it's, it really isn't. And I'm fine. I mean, that's there. That's not even ego speaking. That's just like, sometimes you don't want to go through the struggle. Like I have said no to jobs if I realize that from the initial conversation that it will constantly be me trying to explain to them why and or why their idea won't work, you know? And, but I will never say to somebody, no, I will always give them, I will say, this isn't going to work, but I think this will work. You have to have an answer to saying no. You can't just say I'm not doing that or your idea is stupid because they have a lot of people to answer to you, you know, you, you know, and so if you're not, if you don't basically respect them to say that they've chosen you to stand there and help them get to the point of what they need answered, then you're really not doing your job. And if you stand in the middle of the room and with, you know, you know, with on your, on your pedestal, you know, with your cape and your, and your, and your, and your espresso or your glass of champagne and, and no one can speak to you and they have to talk to you through your assistance. What bullshit is that? I mean, it's like, you know, it's like, you have to enjoy the process. Enjoy. I did that when I directed and it drove, and it was, everyone thought it was hysterical. Like I would always walk over and talk to the clients and sit in the, in the video village when we'd be doing takes sometimes and discuss it with them. And, and everyone was always like, you know, you, you really need to kind of put that wall up. So you have that mystery of who you are. And I go, there's, there's no mystery of who I am. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm right here. I'm just, <laughs> you know, I'm just, you know, they're, they're seeing what's going on. There's no big magical moment happening. So. Well, that's something I always like to hear about too, is like, so, you, you know, you're talking about who you are. But how did you get sort of what I call like, how did you get made? So like, were your parents creative? Did you have some great teachers? Like, what was the thing that sort of introduced you to the creative process and pushed you in that direction? My dad, I didn't grow up with my dad. He left my mom when I was five, but I'd see him like twice a year. But oddly enough, he was in marketing for DuPont Textiles. So he understood the creative industry and I would go visit him. I remember going to Gordon Monroe's studio when I was a kid. For a, for a shoot, you know, and I, and I, not knowing at all, like I was going to be a photographer. I wasn't a photographer. I didn't take pictures at the time or anything, but I remember that and the, the whole thing with the, you know, it was classic seventies, you know, like the, you know, long women in these big dresses and his dogs were running around the studio and it was a big white studio. And it was like, you know, I remember that moment, but it didn't mean anything to me till I thought about it years, you know, years, kind of years gone by. And then my mom, 
when she was younger, she was wanted to be in the theater and she was doing summer stock and she, and, but when she was a kid, women could be three things. You could be a nurse, you could be a teacher, you could be a housewife. So my mom chose being a teacher just because she figured that then she could be at schools and then she could deal with theater programs. I'm, I'm assuming is probably the process that was going in her head. And always supportive of my sister and I in anything in the arts. And we would spend our summers doing summer stock theater. We would go and she'd, she'd get a role, whether it be like, you know, Fiddler on the Roof or Carousel or Oliver. And then my sister and I would maybe get little parts in it. And then my sister ended up becoming a customer on Broadway for years. She retired a couple of years back, but she was for years that she ended up moving into that. So she ended up on Broadway in a million different productions on Broadway over the years, working through costuming houses and going on tour with people or doing that kind of stuff, doing little dressing, little designing, you know, and then I went off and went to photo school, you know, I, I started taking pictures and she let me, we had no money, but she let me build like a little dark room in the basement. And all my friends were taking pictures and, and I don't know what it was. I was taking pictures and then I ended up winning a photo comp competition in high school. Cause I, I don't know why I entered it. I couldn't tell you to this day why I thought I was supposed to put pictures in it. And I ended up winning quite a few prizes. And then there was a guy named Jack DiMaggio and he, he was an art teacher at school. There were three art teachers. The, he was in charge of the yearbook. And I was like a failing student. I was like a you know, a D student in science, you know, and like, I don't know why I did science. It was just kind of, I think I did a little project when I was in sixth grade with hatching of an egg and embryos and that kind of stuff. And I won a prize and I thought that's what I was supposed to be doing, but I, my brain isn't that at all. So he kind of came to me and he said, what do you, what do you, what's your major? And I said, oh, it's science. And he goes like, how are you doing that? I said, not well. And he said, well, maybe you should think about the art. He said, you know, and I, he goes, would you, he goes, what are you gonna do for college? And I said, I have no idea. He said, well, why don't you bring me your pictures and I'll, if you, I'll help you put a portfolio together and look at art schools if you come work on the yearbook with me, which gave me a free pass to wander around too, so I didn't have to go to class. <laughs> so, so I changed it around. I went to art classes and did a lot more art stuff and he put it together and he's, you know, I remember going to see him like about a week before I was going to go to, go to New York City, go to School of Visual Arts. And I was like, I'm not sure what I'm doing. And he looked at me and he said, if you show up on my porch in a week from now and don't go, he goes, I'm going to kick you off my front porch and I'll never talk to you again. And he said, this is ridiculous. You need to go do this, you know? And, and he was so, tremendously supportive in that. So, and we still talk to this day. We'll see, kind of, kind of head back and forth between emails and conversations. And, but he was the first person who kind of like pushed me out the door. And my mother was the same way. She was very supportive of that. And then I got to New York and you know, went to, co went to college and got lucky and ended up meeting a guy named Josh Green, who was Milton Green's son. Milton Green was a photographer who basically did all the pivotal pictures of Marilyn Monroe and Marilyn Monroe lived with him for a while and lived with, lived with the family for a while, babysat Josh when he was a kid. There's great pictures of him and around him. I'm not sure babysat, but, you know, was in the house and took care of him. And there's a lot of funny pictures of the two of them together. His whole approach to photography was completely insane, but we shot food and interiors. But, you know, he would get mirrors and bounce light into the houses and everything about him was just tremendously over the fucking top. I mean, just out of control. And I, I love that, you know, and then I worked for a couple other people and then I met Jeff Dennis and I, he and totally inspired me. And then a guy named Len Irish, who is a photographer in New York, Len is tremendously, was tremendously supportive and, and, and very much a huge mentor of mine still still looking at his work and he blows me away with how he does portraits and but he was the first portrait photographer that I came across which I I hadn't really worked for portrait photographers I worked for interior food and I worked for a guy we were shooting playboy you know Jeff Dennis we were shooting playboy and we magazine and that kind of stuff so it was like very over the top like lighting of these you know, these beautiful, and he would, he was the one who basically say, you know, are you doing anything? Can you come over to the studio? And, and he'd just try things and shooting, you know, women, you know, in different ways in the studio. His, his mind was amazing to me. I had never seen that in my life. And, and then I, along the way, I kind of got lucky and I, to make some money, I shot unit photography on a couple indie movies and that kind of stuff and ended up on a, a short film with a woman named Gretchen Bender 
and uh, she was doing a short art film. And at the time, she was dating Robert Longo, who was a, a, a painter in the 70s and still is today. And Gretchen was doing a movie, a short little movie, and she asked if I could come out for a couple of days. And the whole movie was based upon this one character, and the character was Cindy Sherman. So I spent two days photographing Cindy kind of as this character, as a unit photographer, shooting pictures for them. Robert saw the pictures, and then he was doing a movie called Arena Brains, and then asked me if I would come and work on it with him. And then that started our relationship that I, I would go out and I'd create content for him to be able to draw and paint from for men in the cities and for different things. And, and all the time being supportive, we ended up doing a show in Berlin and uh, it was uh, Bill T. Jones's art dancing. And then there was the photographs that he and I, that, that Robert and I created together at a civil war reenactment. And then there was this kind of sound and everyone's name was pretty much equal in size. He was very much always supportive of that. He still, you know, he did the forward in my book but he would just, he was like, you should be an assistant. He goes, because what do you need? You need, you need a hundred bucks. Here, take a hundred bucks, go, go take pictures, come back. You know, that'll keep you going. Right. You know, and he was very supportive of trying to keep me out of basically working for somebody else, but trying to basically try different things. And then being on film sets, I could see light bouncing around all the time. I could see how light would come off of gels and arc into rooms into dark spaces and how DPs would use things and gaffers would light things. And I, I focused on talking to them. I would take their pictures for the first week on any indie movie I worked on. And I would give them pictures of them working. They then enjoyed having me around and brought me into their fold. So they would, they would allow me to be close to what was going on. And I just kept on collecting these little how light would bounce around and how light would work and how they would work with that. And that was the catalyst of me just trying so many different things of seeing how what if I, what if I use this? What if I use this? What if I use this? You know, you know, and that, you know, and not being, not being so structured that I had to say everything has to be shot with my big Octobank, you know, that I bought, you know, it's like, because I never bought one until like, I think I was in my forties or fifties. I think, I don't know. I bought one just because it was, no, I think I bought one in my fifties is when I bought one. It was just because I needed something as an overall kind of a, a big film because I was doing all these stuff on sets and I needed a big light to do it. And now we use, you know, it's like George and I are always going through the process of what's next on Gray Seamless because I have to light all these things for Gray Seamless for like for movie posters and TV advertising. And so we're always trying to think of what's what, what how else can we do this? So we'll constantly change out what our key light is, how we like, how we like the things just to make it interesting because otherwise, but then we have a million different ways of doing it. Every, everything has a solution. There is no, you can't light a picture in a, in a room that's, that has eight foot ceilings and, and it's 12 by 12 and they want like, you know, they want you to build a studio in that. There is no, you just do it. You know, it's like, you know, and you, and then from that becomes the most interesting picture because of that. Well, you're the way you use light is one of those things that I like really was enamored with, with your work throughout, you know, just all of it. But like it, it you do it in such a timeless way. Like it, it's, it's one of the things I'm, as I said, I'm a professor and like, I'm constantly trying to express to my students, like, you know, photography is like writing with drawing with light. Like, so like light is of the utmost importance and, and being able to just even recognize the beautiful light, first of all, and then being able to actually, you know, achieve some photographic representation using that light is like, is at the, the the core of almost every beautiful photograph you've ever seen. And a lot of people don't seem to understand that. And it sort of drives me nuts. Yeah. It became the point of style, stylists and objects more than light. And photography is the capturing of light. I mean, that's what we do. And it's the last thing as a photographer that we can control. We can, we decide what light we're going to use and how we're going to basically bring it to them. And then how you can take a viewer to the person and, you know, by the, by the use of light, you can isolate what you want someone to look at in the picture. And it's such a nice kind of little thing you can do. And I taught a class, I, I, a friend of mine, Everard at Art Center had me come in and teach a semester with him. I told him at the beginning of the thing, I said, tell you what, I want everyone to keep a light journal. And, and, and it, this was before we had, you know, iPhones and that kind of stuff. I go just, you know, every day, try to find a picture 
that that light is creating something that you and then know how you and make notes to it so then you can recreate it later on like you're sitting in a cafe and you know it's like i you know by the first one i always say is if you ever sit in an airplane you watch when the airplane banks and the sun comes through the airplane and, and just watch that light and how that simple light can change that like six different ways of seeing something right hard piece of light comes in hits the white illuminates the whole room then comes through and stops hitting the light and then starts creating these shadows across something you can watch it's such a wonderful little education moment if you if you're if you're being aware it's like it's the stop and smell the roses mentality of of what we do for a living so i would say to them like you're sitting in a cafe and a truck pulls up and it's white and it hits the sun on this and the white light gets pushed through the room and hits the red wall next to you and you look at the person sitting in front of you and there's this white edge coming around them and the red lights coming across their face and then you make notes saying oh if i do this if i do this if i do this what kind of light is it it's a hard light it's a soft light you know what is it make note to that and then when you go take pictures then you can basically say this is the light i want to create it's the simplest approach to basically educating yourself as a photographer it's you can do that for yourself you don't need anyone to teach you that you just got to look you just got to be open to allowing yourself to just be absorbed by your surrounding agreed yeah yeah i mean it's you know the the nature of light is one of those just like fundamental things that I'm, i feel like is not uh, respected as as much these days as it used to be. Like, I mean, you know, I go back to like, you know, Irving Penn, Horse P. Horse, to George Hurl. Like, they were masters of light kind of thing. And like, that's not really respected or admired as much these days. At least I feel like it's not. I could be wrong. I, I think it's something that people don't even teach anymore because they don't even understand it themselves. There's a guy named Clay Patrick McBride. He's basically, he's a teacher at in RIT and he was a kid I knew back in the day and he teaches now, he teaches his students way outside the box, which he should. You should basically excite people to push themselves, which is what I do. You know, I do this thing when I'm teaching, I do the first day I make them. And I get the people get my classes are everything from people that are probably making, making more money than I am as a photographer and doing lifestyle and doing other advertising to like the guy who's like the weekend warrior, you know what I mean? Who just basically has a job of the weekend he goes and takes pictures. And so I had this arc of people and the first day I break them into groups of three and I get them all. So I buy, I buy them a silver card and I say, just go around and find natural light. You can make weird pictures with this little card and looking at light. Don't just walk over and stand in front of the light and go soft light. That's an obvious find something else, break your brain up, go out and just keep failing and failing until you see something happen. And then the second day I had them all go out. And I had them go to Home Depot or a, or a hardware store or a lighting store. And I go find anything that makes light, anything that would basically diffuse light, and make light. And the next day I take them into a dark room and I go make something happen. Light painting, you know, if you do this, if you do this, work with the shadows and the light and that kind of stuff. And I say to them, none of this is to become me or try to be me. It's what it is, is to see what you find in yourself that you have not pushed yourself to try to be. And you may never use any of this stuff again, but it's to show you that what we do is fun. That you can push all the boundaries you want there. I mean, I've never been good with people saying you can't do this in photography. There is nothing that can't be done in photography anymore. I mean, there really isn't. And, and then the other point is everything's been done. Well, you know, until you've done it, it hasn't been done. Because if even if I was to take you into a place that I took a picture that you liked, and I was to set up the lights for you, exactly how I did it, the picture would be different. It's the choice of when you shot, when you chose to basically push the button, and when you chose what you told the person to do. There is no no, I guess, or like you can't again agreed yeah i'm yeah. sorry i'm just sitting here just like fanboying listening to this. <laughs> i'm not i'm just trying not to interrupt. i'm just blabbering on like i usually do and <laughs> it's lovely i have no complaints it is fun when you're doing lectures sometimes and you look out at an audience and you're doing all this and you think and you look over and you and during festivals people have been out all day shooting and you'll look over and you'll find the one or two people that are just like 
<laughs> just like just knocked out, you know. And and I think it's hysterical. I'm always just kind of like, well, that's what it is. That's just, like, you know, it's like there's always gonna be one or two people that are just like too tired to kind of hear me talk on and on, you know. So, but <laughs> no, this is fabulous. You have no idea. <laughs> But early on, you you talked about like the nature of reinvention. And that's one of those things like because, well, you talked about style, like having a signature style and how you've never done that and reinventing and how you're very, you know, pro doing that. And this is something that like I keep wondering about because like I, I know lots of people who are successful by finding a style and that works for them. And I know yeah. a lot of people who are successful by by you know reinventing themselves you know every decade or so, let's say. But it, it, both of those choices are very difficult in and of themselves because you know one way you could alienate people, the other way you could get bored. So like, how do you sort of? I guess the easiest way is like keep it fresh for you. Like, how do you find new inspirations to keep you going? I, I just try to be open to whatever. I mean, I kind of I go to a lot of. I go see a lot of art. I don't go see a lot of photography, which is kind of funny, but I go, I Agreed. go. Agreed. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I totally agree with that. Like you get obsessed by photography. It often influences you a little too much. Like mm -hmm. you, yeah. you end up copying it. So, but yeah. like the seeing, you know, beautiful sculpture or great painting or whatever sort of is, I find much more inspiring than seeing somebody else taking pictures. Yeah. No, and I, and I, and I try to take the energy out of how somebody paints or draws or sculpts and i mean like to walk through a richard Serra sculpture is a spiritual thing to me and watch how light moves through it and how he has structured it and you take that brain and it has nothing to do with the sculpture it has everything to do with what it what it what it made you feel and that is what you tr what i try to basically when i'm re trying to reinvent myself is like what what haven't i felt yet or what am i trying to get to as somebody who's just trying to create the next visual part of my life and that's the hard part it's like it's hard to suddenly let go of something that you've been comfortable with it's you know it's easy to stay in your comfort zone it's 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 really hard when you just dive off and go like i have no idea what's going to happen you know and 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 there's always that knee jerk when I'm shooting things for myself is that I'll do things I've done first and then I'll try to move into the thing that I haven't done. And it's usually just trying to feel out the person I'm photographing and what I get from them and how far they will go with me down the rabbit hole. Because it, 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 no matter who you're shooting, whether it be a model or a, or a person, you have to see how much they're going to give you before you start asking sometimes. You know, and when I started out, it was not that way at all. I just, and the light thing, going back to the light conversation, I was thinking about it is that a lot of the reasons that my light is all over the fucking place is because people don't do anything. I was being sent to shoot people that would just be like this and they would just stare at you. And then, so if they aren't going to do anything interesting, then I'm going to have to figure out a way to make it interesting. So, you know, finding some weirdly weird piece of light or unusual piece of light or something that they would define or kind of sculpt them that was what i could do and then i had to start creating them because obviously you know you can't always rely on certain things so i started making notes about like what i liked about things and i'd say well what creates that and then i'd bring that light i have it ready it's easy to turn on but i'm also a big person if you give me 10 minutes i'll try to do three pictures because i just because most people don't even last more than you know like five or six frames they they, they gave you everything they're going to give you and sometimes if you shoot quick enough, they'll go like, oh, is that it? And I'm like, well, did you want to try something else? And they're like, oh, well, we, and they'll look, oh, we could try this. And then it's kind of fun. It's like, then you get a little extra out of them. So, yeah, I have this tendency that I, I feel like the, when you're out doing a photo shoot, one of two things happens. Either the first image you took is the best or the last image you took, but it's rarely any of the ones in the middle. Yeah. Sometimes in the middle, it's just a, just, it's just a conversation you can see the kind of rolling to either away from what you've done and then they're bored or they're kind of feeling you out to get to that last picture. So, yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Now, one thing I was wondering about you is like going back to my whole fanboy thing. So like, you know, your images to me were very iconic of a, of a, of a time period. So like, let's take the Rolling Stone era. So like, you know, late eighties, early nineties, the kind of era. 
like it, you to me <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so bad i'm so sorry that i never do this on the podcast but i'm gonna do it anyways but like it was like <laughs> you made the visual like iconic images that defined me as a young person and so like i'm wondering how does that feel and and like how do you get past that because like you don't want to be stuck in no yeah. you know known for something from this one time that you're not doing anymore so like how do you like make such these these iconic images that have become ingrained in people's lives you know from like you know, uh, magazine covers, album covers, these kinds of things that end up sort of like being things that people are like, oh my God, remember the kid, this album cover, you know, yeah. and then, but then get past that, like, so like then continue on. Cause like, it's, I know a lot of artists that like sort of make these like seminal works that define a, a generation and then sort of never really go beyond that, make anything great again, kind of thing. So like, how do you get over that hump, I guess? I guess I just never thought of anything of it that way. I guess I, I, I don't, I always, I make fun of, I mean, I, I, the internet has made me suddenly known. Let's say that much. Okay. So I didn't, def, I, you know, I just, I never thought I was really sick that, that I was, I was famous or that successful. I knew I was working, you know what I mean? And that I was shooting and I was happy and I was taking the pictures I wanted to take. And if people understood them, they understood them. And if they didn't, they didn't. And I kept on just kind of going forward. I didn't ever get wrapped up in the, 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 the bullshit of that. I'm, I'm still not like, I mean, I, you know, if you look at the whole photo industry, I am out of the fame aspect of what this thing is and who's famous as a photographer and who's not. I, I have, I have my niche, I guess I would say. I have the people who have basically, who are, who love the far end of what photography is, right? You're definitely one of them and you get it, right? Yes. But a lot of what I do doesn't make sense to anybody. So, and some people don't understand why I'd be successful or who I am and how I do things. And, and, and that's okay. You know what I mean? I, I don't really care one way or the other. I'm not, you know, it's like, it goes back to the conversation as to who I'm creating for, you know what I mean? So you have to kind of keep that in your mind. If you're constantly worried about, are they going to accept me? You know, oh, that I'm going to keep doing this picture because it was so successful. There is, you know, there's, it just is what it is at that point. So I, I don't like getting wrapped up into that because I just, and, and that allows me also, like, I mean, I did a lecture about three, three or four years ago, I did a lecture. There was a, there's a, a competition they do for all these high school students and they all end up coming to Los Angeles and this teacher brings them all here and they go visit photography studios and photographers and designers and that kind of stuff. And he's asked me for years to do it. And I, I did it. So I met him all at a studio. I looked at the class and, and he said, this is Frank Ockenfels and he's a photographer and he does entertainment music and he has other things he does. And they're all just looking at me like this. And then I kind of started, I said, so does anyone know my name? And they're all like, and they're like, no one knew me. And I said, name some photographers, you know who they are. And of course they were the, you know, the classics. That they did. And I said, I said, all ego aside, the minute I start showing my work, you're going to know who I am. And it's just because I've been given the opportunity to shoot certain things that in of your generation, that you know that work. Okay. But I like that you don't know who did it. I like that you like it a lot of people I was and and with my face not being out there in the old days of the internet and and all that it's just was fascinating and sure enough I you know I and I I totally I did weigh it out to basically make to the who their age was so I showed like the walking dead and breaking bad and like you know American horror story and and there are all these things that came out that and they're all looking at me going like you shot all this and I'm like yeah this is what I do for a living and then I also shot these musicians I did a talk one time at my son, my younger son, Cooper was in a, doing a film class and I went and I talked about making movie posters and art and, you know, making, you know, doing any of that kind of stuff. And, and it was the same kind of thing. Like you can say your name, but in most, most people in general don't know photographers names. They know the work and that's okay. I don't, I think it's good to know who do, does things, but it's not important. I don't need to be defined by, that I don't want to be defined by that I'm the guy who shot American Horror Story, or I'm the guy who did Years of, of Mad Men. I want you to appreciate the work and go, oh, that's who did it. 
you know, it's like that kind of, are you famous because of, of this picture or are you famous because of the name? And I think the name drive, the name drive thing is kind of boring because then there's an expectation when and that they, they'll accept no matter how bad the picture is. You know what I mean? Oh, but Frank shot it. It's like, how bullshit is that? It's just kind of like, yeah, Frank shot it. And guess what? It sucks. <laughs> it's like, it's awful. I mean, like, yeah, he's, he's, he did this really well. I'd rather just be happy. You like the picture than you backtrack and you figure out that it's me who did it. That's more interesting to me. So the fame thing has always been, I mean, I don't even know if fame sounds bad. I mean, I I'm known, I'm known in the industry. I'm known for what I do. I, the book has been a grand example of like who gets me, who doesn't get me kind of thing. I mean, I had clients look at the book and say, I never even knew you did all this stuff. You know what I mean? I didn't know you, who did all the, or they'd say to me, who did all the drawings in your, in your, in your, in your book? And I'd be like, I did, you know, it's just, you know, and, and, but that's just, you know, it's what you want to know about somebody, you know, and, and as the industry gets, as I get older and the industry gets younger, it's been interesting to see, you know, coming in and trying to, you know, be part of that conversation and make them understand, you know, that the idea of just because you're young and you want to hire a young photographer doesn't mean you're going to get what you want. And ego, it's like walking in and just saying like, what I do is genius. I know everything I do is amazing. <laughs> Don't even question me. <laughs> Why are you questioning me? Go away. You know, it's kind of like, you know, I, I've, I've been, the, the most bizarre things have been said to me as, as an old man at this point, you know, I'm standing in a room and I'm the, I'm now at 61. I'm the oldest guy in the room the majority of the time. I am older than the talent. I am older than my, than any of the art directors or the people who hired me. And, and I will still get questioned. I will still be questioned. Like, do you know what you're doing? Or, do you know, or, you know, why would we do that? We want to do this or, and you know what? You just got to smile and go like, yeah, cool. What I've learned at this point is you just know how much to tweak it. You know what I mean? You go like, you know, I'm going to really, I'm going to say, this is what you're thinking, but this is what I'm doing. And they usually will get it. They majority of time somebody will understand that that I'm I'm listening to them. I'm just not doing exactly what's in their head because it doesn't make any sense. And I have and I have answered their their problem or their their you know what they want to do. And I have given them the, 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 a choice to go outside of that or push the boundaries of that idea. And that to me is amazing. I love that. So. You, you brought up the the inspiration of like art and other things like this a lot. Like I was wondering, like, do you have an art collection? I do. We, I, I have an odd art collection, I guess I'd say. The majority of the art I have has been things that I've traded with friends. I would be more than honored to trade with you if you're interested. <laughs> just throwing it out there. I've traded with so many people just because I enjoy that part of that. It's a shared point of art, you know, like, and I, it's like once a year, Jeff Dennis, who uh, that runs the Palm Springs Photo Festival, he has a breakfast, the once a year breakfast, and it's all the photographers who live in Los Angeles. And the first year I showed up, it was like crazy. It was at the Beverly Hills Tennis Club, and we all sat in the back room, and it's about about eighteen photographers. And I walked in, and I'm like, "Holy shit! What did I get invited to?" And it's like Jim Marshall, it was Claxton, it was Herman Leonard. It was Melvin Sokolsky. It was Douglas Kirkland. It was like, and then, then there was like some journalists who I know, like David Kennedy. I mean, like all these, I mean, it was just like, I'm sitting in the room, I'm the kid. I'm the kid in the room. And so the next year came around and I said, I do this thing with friends where we basically make a box. We meet once a year, we make a box. And there's musicians and painters and whatever. So the box contains... There's five boxes, five of the exact same things in the box. I said, wouldn't it be fun if we decided to make a box of all these photographers? We met once a year, we make enough, like there's 18 boxes here. We make 18 people, 18 boxes. We all make 18 prints. We number them. We say, this is what it was for this day. And they all bought off on it. So we started doing these boxes. I kind of monitored them a couple of years and then other people started putting them together over the years and more people came and people passed, you know, like, you know, like a lot of the photographers died, which because they were all of a certain age and it was just like, I mean, so boy, being in that moment and being able to be in the room with him and having, you know, Kurt conversations with just crazy conversations with Jim Marshall or just very insightful ones. And, and Douglas Kirkland, I mean, is like, you know, 
unbelievable. He's still, he's still with us and so amazing as a photographer. And so, yeah, it's just been kind of a, a crazy thing that way, being able to kind of be inspired by the, the other photographers that you get to be standing around and sharing. And like, because I think photography has a sense to be everyone's like, you know, terrified to talk about and be friendly with each other because, you know, they're going to take work away. And it's like, they hire you for, they hire you, not because, you know, you, it's not just because you said the right thing. I, I always make jokes about being a photographer. It's like being the cruise director. It's like, if you can get corral everybody around and get them to stand here and all of a sudden go bang, you're doing it. That's about 60% of the job. I mean, it's a huge part of the job is having enough of a, of the ability to make someone feel comfortable to get in, into a place what you want them to do and not to make them feel stupid in doing it. Because who likes to be photographed? Come on. It's like, you know, it's really, you know, not even models half the time, you know, it's like, they're like, okay, we're doing this. Okay, we're doing this. You know, it's like, you know, so, but, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> sorry, you just bring up so many topics that I'm just like, oh, my God, what do I want to know more about? <laughs> <laughs> Are there any topics you want to talk about that I that I might not even know to ask about? I always want to talk about inspiration, and we've talked about that already, which I think is important. I mean, I could, you can blather on about you know like I did this and I did that, and that's all like you know that's all fun to hear. And if anyone really wants to look at stuff, I mean, they can go to my website and look at stuff. And there's enough little movies of me blathering about myself out there at this point. But I I think the key thing is 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 talking about inspiration and how you know, it's like inspiration comes from so many places, you know, and it's not just in photography. It's not just in the art. It's, it's the inspiration comes from so many levels of, of just who you surround yourself by what you choose to basically look at. So, and, and, and what inspires you may not inspire somebody else, but that's okay. And accepting that. And then, and it's fun to kind of look down, like saying that inspires you. Mm, I'm curious. It's like going to a museum with five people and then seeing what everyone reacts to. It's amazing. It's never the same pieces. And I and it's what's kind of amazing is you well, I have two sons and I've taken them to museums and it's and it's fascinating. My wife and I always comment afterward like what they react to. And my oldest Beckett, we were in Paris on a job. He he basically graduated from high school and, and I and he was going to go to art school and I and I said, take a year off, come with me on the road and decide if this is really where you want to go with this career kind of thing. Cause he'd worked on jobs. So for a year, I had him travel with me. Of course, the first job out of the gate was we went to Paris on a job. So which was like, you know, could this be any more, you know, <laughs> ridiculous? So he wanted to go out. He was really big on clothes. Then. He wanted to go shopping. And, and they were having all these sales in Paris. And I said, I need you to come to two museums before you go do that. And he, and he was like, okay, okay. And my assistants all know, like, like and my whole crew knows when we go into a city, we're going to museums, you know, like, you know, when we get off the, off the plane in, in London, we usually come in in the morning and we usually go over the Tate Modern in the afternoon and we walk around and we just look around and see what's going on. And, and if we have time, we'll go see, other, we'll go see other things. But Tate Modern is always like the number one thing we go to go experience when we're in, in London. But I took Becca to the Musée d'Orsay because that has such an, a bizarre collection of stuff, you know, everything. I was just there two months ago. Yeah, it's in an old train station. It's unbelievable. You walk in and he's looking around and I'm trying to take him to uh, certain paintings that I'm, you know, like if there's a Eugene Carrier, which I really love there. But he, we walk into this one room and there was those huge oil paintings. And I thought his head was going to explode. He was like, and I saw him and I kept on walking and he's still staring at them. I'm like, do you like these? And he goes, these are amazing. I mean, to see someone get it, I mean, and I could have assumed what he would what he would like, but you can't. You can't. Art is one of those things that things will hit you or they won't hit you. It's like, and there's, and you can't tell you that everyone's going to love Picasso. Everyone's going to love like, like people love Rothko, and I do not understand it. I mean, I and I always hear the voice of Francis Bacon in my head going like, oh, if you like that, you go over and you get a couple of swatches of maroon fabric, and then you. Get the, I mean, you just it's like. I don't get it. I mean, I get the process. I get the idea. I get everything about it. But if I'm going to go look at something, no, I'll, I, I could stare for hours at a Francis Bacon painting, or I could go through a million different artists that I just, you know, I just love the energy behind it. Maybe I don't like the piece, but I love the energy. Ansel Kiefer is somebody that I've always been obsessed by, you know, seeing, I see whatever he can do. Richard Serra's walking through his sculptures it's kind of one of those things. So it's, 
I to be inspired to go out and look and support local arts and going and seeing things and trying to basically just keeping immersing yourself in that. That's where your vision will change. That's where you will pick up little bits and pieces. And then when you actually choose to create, that stuff comes out usually, I think. We hope so. But you have to be open in mind. You can't, you can't walk in with any kind of negativity and say, I don't like this person because, and then you haven't even looked yet. No, I try my best never to like have the, any sort of preconceived th ideas when I look at new art. Now, I mean, of course, if it's somebody that I've already known, it's like, eh, pfft, whatever, <laughs> you know, yeah. you're over, you've seen it before, you know, yeah. I've, I've seen a Rothko, I don't need to like stare at this Rothko again. Right. It was interesting, there was, there was a show of it at the Tate Britain, and it was in a room next to the Turner, so it's like everything is right next to that, so, and it, and, it, and you know what's funny is it made sense next to that. It was a modern kind of take on what the landscape might be, that kind of thing, I got that, I, I understood how they kind of went together. But, you know, I went to the Cy Twombly Museum in Texas. It's in, I think it's in Houston, where it is. And it's unbelievable. You walk through all his stuff and you see the, the, just, I, his stuff kind of makes me nuts. Because I just look at it and go like, oh, you know, that's, that's a brain I love. You know, it's kind of that weird line. You know, they always talk about like the, you know, the, the hardest part of doing anything is that for, uh, as a painter or, or someone who draws is, is basically the first line you're going to cut through because you're, it's so precious and it's not. You know, I've been taking these drawing classes with this guy named Robbie Nett, who's an amazing illustrator. And my wife and I, he does these online classes and he teaches at the Newell School. Newell, 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 I think it's guy named Newell. But he's this crazy illustrator. And every time, every, his whole thing is like, when you get happy, keep going, don't stop. He goes, just because all of a sudden you love something, keep going over it. Just keep going over it and over it and over it and over it. And it goes, it's just, you can't, you know, don't, nothing is precious. You'll like an energy of where it's going. You'll know when it gets there, but don't be so much like you make a line and the line is so perfect that you did that, that, that stops you. That's a big statement. Well, that's one of those things that I've run into is like, I'm, you know, I have this habit of one of two things, either underworking something like not pushing it far enough or overworking it. And it's very hard to find that perfect time to stop. Like when it's it like to, to, you know, be precious enough, but like, right. but, but go far enough. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, I mean, I, that's the thing about it is if you're working something too far, it's because it still hasn't made itself. I mean, you on the way you've seen the things that you've done, or you've seen the things that you that you thought you wanted to do. But even when you got to that point, they weren't what you wanted. They didn't. It didn't click in your brain to stop. And I think that that's something you need to listen to. Sometimes just stepping back because you're so immersed in the moment kind of thing. Greg Heisler, who's a great photographer, he's talked about like if you're doing someone's portrait, sometimes before you say I'm done, you need to stand up and walk away for a second and come back. Say, excuse yourself to go to the bathroom, stand up to basically just do something simple, walk back over. Because sometimes as a photographer, you're so focused on just staring through that lens and trying to get to that point that you're, that you, that you've lost any ability to kind of see outside of what that narrow little point is. And, and as a photographer, it's really hard because you're looking through this little hole so you can't really look much wider sometimes, you know, and or allow yourself to see outside. So that's that's really tough. But, you know, it's and it's the same thing. There's a great documentary, Visions of Light, by that's it. Uh, it's about the history of cinematography. And, and they talk to all these amazing, you know, cinematographers and they talk about, you know, it's one, one of them, I forgot who said it, but it's the exciting point of walking in and basically striking that first light into a dark space. You know what I mean? And, and that's, that's our first line as a photographer. I always said, I always just always say like, you know, you, you know, there's a couple of photographers I know that believe that nothing good has ever been shot in natural light, you know, and I always kind of laugh about it, you know, I go like, oh, okay, that's cool. But, um, <laughs> but at the same point it's, and they won't ever, they, they don't ever, they'll walk in and block all the windows off of, of a room and then light it back for themselves. To me, the first thing, if I'm given a room and I have to shoot something in there, the first thing I do usually is take an exposure of the room, seeing what's given. What's given that I can just maybe enhance with something, you know, like what's the practicals, what's the natural. But sometimes that's what makes the moment more than the point of you over, over lighting everything. 
speaking of that, like if, uh, from a technical standpoint, I also know that like you did a lot of Polaroid, like PN film for many, many oh, yeah. years. How, how, did, how, how are you still able to get it? Are you still shooting it or? I have a few boxes of 55 left. I have uh, some Polaroid I collect. Some I have some 665 left. Most of it doesn't really work. You kind of go to shoot it and it just falls apart when you're shooting with it. That was like one of those things I had to give up. I mean, I started, I decided the other day on my Instagram, I decided to start basically posting to do this Polaroid thing that I would say like, these are all portraits I did with a Type 55 Polaroid with the Super D graphics. And they were all done within moments and allowing just this was the light and this is what it was. And then we, then we kind of, you know, then, then we moved on, you know what I mean? And I didn't, I didn't make a big thing of it kind of thing. So I'm going to start posting like once a week, I'll post a portrait. I did that way just because I remind myself the simplicity of photography. Yeah. I mean, it's fascinating. Like a lot of us that are in the creative industries. So like, you know, let's just call it fine artists, like painters and this, and LS, but even graphic designers, like we got into being creative because we don't like being business people. Like we intentionally were like, I either cannot do it or I do not want to do it. But in the end, we're still a business. Right. And that is the business of, of the arts. Even if you aren't like a commercial photographer or anything else, you're still gonna have to deal with the business of it. If, you, if you're being an art photographer, you still have to understand the business of the value of your work or getting people to pay your bills or making deals and that kind of stuff. It's, it's all there and it's, I mean, I think even if they were to teach it in college, no one would take the class. I took the class and the class would see the problem with that is, and I'm a professor. So like I'm as much of a problem uh, that it causes this, but the problem with that is, is that the people who are teaching those courses were taught 30 years ago when they were in school about how to do it. And then they've been in academia for 30 years. So they're not actually practicing artists or practicing commercial whatevers. And so they don't actually know the contemporary way of doing these things. And so they're teaching something 30 years old so right. that it doesn't work right. and that's and part of that is why i created this podcast so that me as a teacher through conversations with people like you can learn how it's working now right so i spoke of my oldest a minute ago back and he went to uh art school and he'd been on the road with me for a year and he saw he, he's been in the industry with me for years and so when he went to school you know he he probably experienced things that the majority of his teachers probably never experienced so when they started saying things like the, the one thing that kind of came up was they made all the first year students take lightroom as a class that 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 all professionals use lightroom and i was kind of like and beck had turned and he was like uh you know uh you know i think it's capture one they all use in the professional world and i lightroom isn't and i know who i know i know what kind of i know what the you know, and Lightroom is used a lot by wedding photographers because it's probably a really easy, and that's not dismissing. I mean, there's, there's a job I never want to have. And it's not because of any kind of ego. It's terrifying to me. I've shot a wedding. It's like, un, it is probably the most nerve wracking thing I have ever done in my life. I don't want to ever do it. And it's like, because this is it and and talk about disrespect i mean people just come over and photograph this they're yanking at you and it's like so anyone who does this for a living is unbelievable i mean and i've seen some tremendous stuff i mean like how the hell i mean i've shot weddings i've never seen that picture i've never they are the they these people are amazing at what they do i mean they are really really artists in basically the idea of getting people around to get to a point that you need to get them in the height of all this insanity and what's going on. I, I think is, is people, people always laugh at wedding photographers. They, they, you know, it's like, that's like being a war photographer. It's like you're in the middle of like all this shit and you're, and you're getting good pictures out of it. Though people are probably pr prettier. So, but, um, but uh, I don't know where I was going with all that, but oh, so you were talking about Lightroom and your son. He taught him like, and, and he was like, this isn't, and, and they taught it so badly and how they did things and they did, there wasn't anything being open. And, and a lot of the stuff he was learning was stuff that was just like, you, you don't know what's going on in this moment. And photography is changing so fast right now. And everything is going so fast. It's not just 
go shoot a roll of film, process it, print it, and this is what's going to be. It's not that way. And you have that part of it. And he did do that. And then he had a teacher who basically, like, he shoot a roll of film and he couldn't decide what picture he wanted to print that of what he liked. They had to pick the picture. And there's nothing, they, and, and what is that teaching you? I mean, to me, it's like, you're not allowing someone to show you what they see if you don't let them print it. Or if you're going to say, don't print that one, but also please print this one. Give them options of what's going on. And the other thing that was happening was really awful for him was they would say to him, you know, well, you know, we made a joke at one point about sending him to school without the last name Ockenfels, you know what I mean? To use his last name being Wiedemann. Because not all the teachers knew who I was, but some, some of them did. And they would say, well, you don't want to be your dad. You know, and without even looking at who he was as a photographer, is because they didn't even allow themselves to look at, see what he was doing, to see how different he was and how he was his own. I mean, he is never, he's a really amazing photographer. And he, he never once looked at me and said, give me a lesson on how to do this. His was all observation. I mean, he'd say, I bought a light once and, and I wasn't doing much with it. And it kind of reminded me of my wife at a certain point. I'll, I'll tell you why. But he'd say, can I use this light? And I'm like, yeah, do you want me to try to use it? No, no, I got it. And he always, so he'd take it and he would use it the way he saw it, which was so much more interesting than me teaching him how to use it. And then he had to work backwards. My wife would do the same thing with cameras when we were dating is she would say, what's that camera do? And I go, oh, I, I haven't used it in a while. And I pick it up and, and, and then she'd go take a picture with it. And I'd see that I was so wrapped up in this part of it that I wasn't looking at this part of it. And she would do the most amazing picture with it, just one off and kind of like say, well, this does this. And, with, and there's an innocence in it, in it, you know, which is much more interesting to approach things without so much knowledge behind something sometimes. In learning photography anymore, it's just, I, I kind of want to go back uh, to that kind of era where art school is art school. There is no, it's, it's, it's just like he had one class, it was great, where everyone threw a piece of art in the middle of the room and then they had to pick something up and then create something out of it. That's what art school should be. It shouldn't be about, and then there should be the aspect of saying, if, you want, if you're going to go, if you, everyone should understand the business, you don't want to get ripped off. I mean, if you basically point, point it out that way, that would be the best way of doing it. You know what I mean? Not just say, you need to learn the business of photography. You got to make it sound much more like to somebody of that age that that's why they need to learn something about the business of photography because later on your work you want to make sure you understand your worth as a photographer or what your art is worth so no one basically takes advantage of what that is right but in general when i mean when i teach nothing is ever awful i mean you can't you can't say that to somebody and if you're going to say to them this isn't working let's talk about where this can go you need to just keep opening people's minds up to basically allowing them to keep going forward and go forward. And, and then within, within how they're seeing, you can't take them too far about a, out of how they're seeing because that's too hard for people. You need to kind of keep them in a line and then start slowly widening that out. You can't just dismiss anybody. Nobody is awful at what they're doing. They're just not basically finding where they want to go with it sometimes. Indeed, yeah. You you brought up the nature of like prints and things like this, or you mentioned the word print, and it made me think about it. Like, do you print out all of your stuff? Because you know, I mean, in the old days, of course, we printed everything. A lot everything. of photographers work primarily on screens, and then all this yeah. kind of stuff. So, like, do you still value the print? I print things out to tear them up sometimes, so it's kind of fun, you know. And then I'll print things out and stick them on my wall. I have a wall over my desk which I collage on, and I just kind of keep inspiration stuff. So much of it now, I mean, I would say that 90% of the stuff I shoot in a year never gets printed out. It's always on a screen, you know what I mean? It's just very different timing. Where it used to be, we, you know, you'd shoot a job and boxes of contact sheets and negatives would show up at your house and you'd go through with your little, you know, China marker and mark off the ones you liked. And then you'd send it to a printer and the printer would print. Then you get these prints and, oh, the experience of opening a box of prints, you know what I mean? And looking at them and seeing them done. It's funny because I've been going through a, a friend of mine, David Frawley, great photographer. He still prints for, you know, he's printed, he prints for Hero and for like for a lot of very big photography. He worked for Hero back in the day as a printer, but he and a, a group of guys used to have a place called Silver Works and they printed for every major photographer in New York City at the time, you know, from, from uh, Annie Leibovitz to Penn to, you know, all the way down in Abaddon. I remember being there one day and I was, and you could go in with them. There were like three or four printers and you'd go in and 
you could go sit in the darkroom with them as they were printing and, and talk about the process that they were doing it if you wanted to. Or you could sit in the room and they would bring you the prints out into a room and they, you know, if they, well, can we try this? And they go in and they change it and they come back in again. And I was there one day doing that and Abaddon was doing a show and he was coming in to look at his prints and they said, can you come to stand in the office for a couple of minutes? And I was like, sure. Yeah. So I stepped in and, and, he, and he, you know, Avedon still poked his head and said, hi. And I'm like, hey, how you doing? You know, and, and we talked for a second and it was just, but that was kind of the wonderful energy of that place. You could actually kind of experience all these great photographers. But so David still prints for me when I, I decided to go backwards because about 90% of the stuff, 99% of the stuff I shot with Bowie was film. I didn't shoot a lot of digital when I, when I worked with him. David and I decided to basically start going through and making a series of 2024, like five each of 2024 black and white prints of images that I really, that I really love. So we've been doing that. So every once, I haven't been able to do it in a bit, but I usually, if I go to New York on a job, I'll spend an extra day and I'll go and we'll sit there and, and we'll print like two or three of the images to kind of catch up on what we haven't printed yet. And it is to sit in the room or to smell the chemicals or to watch him do his artistry as a printer is, is, is exciting i mean it really does it's like a complete memory that washes over my over my head it's exciting i started just just to basically see how much i could screw with things because polaroids were going away i bought i bought monobath of which you so you can process a roll of film in three minutes and it's like and it's kind of crazy it, yeah you basically it's a very it's it's i don't know how archival it is i don't know what it does i don't know what the whole history behind it is or where it's going to go in the end it's not perfect it it leaves it, it's it's kind of like pulling a polaroid sometimes when things go wrong and there's bubbles or there's pulls or there's streaks or and it's and it, it, you know you can go online and learn all the ways of doing it the right way the wrong way I choose the wrong way half the time just for the fun of it, just because I I'll shoot a bunch of stuff and go like, what happens if I take all this four by five film and I just start dunking it and seeing what they look like? You know what I mean? I would expect no less from you. Well, and, and why not? You know, because if it's perfect, then, you know, it doesn't, you know, there's a, what, I love when things go wrong. And then there's sometimes you go like, oh, I wish they hadn't gone too far, but it did, you know, so. But it all, I, I kind of, that's kind of the only way I'm shooting film anymore is if I can kind of screw around with it for myself. Well, it's, it's interesting because like I was sort of taught in the era of that the film was precious like so that you don't you know it's 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 a it's gold you don't you don't damage it or, or anything like this and like I've grown past that completely like at this point I don't fucking care like I, I'll I'll drag it down the street I'll do whatever I want to the negative because the negative is still an element of the expression I mean don't get me wrong our teachers were teaching us like things like you know, treat your negative preciously and then basically you can do the fucked up shit in the dark room kind of thing. But as long as you still have that negative, you can sort of redo those those fucked up processes. But like, I'm at a huge advocate at this point of like, go ahead and fuck up your negatives. It's fine. Yeah. I had a teacher my first year of uh, art school and he took a roll of 35 millimeter film. And my assumption is it's the same roll of film he's been using for years. And he walks in and he takes the end of it and he uh, exposes the whole thing. And he goes, this is nothing until you put something on it. And that's what he would say. So then he goes, so don't be so precious about buying a roll of film. It's just a roll of film. It's just like, but if you can get something on it you love, it's a whole different thing. And, I, and, and you go like, oh, yeah. Then it kind of made you a little freer in thought of what that is. But it is hard. It's that whole like, you know, we, I grew up, I mean, which I don't imagine you've gone through is the uh, zone system, the Ansel Adams zone system which I never learned and I never had any interest in learning. And, and it just seemed to look, when I looked around and saw people doing things where the stuff I thought was interesting was like, well, how'd you get that contrast? Oh, I process all my film in 80 degree water, you know, 80 degree chemical. And it would basically, it creates that contrast to it. Or, I mean, everything had to have, if everything is done the exact same way, then that's all it's going to be. And I was much more of the, like Sigmar Poke, where he would take the like all the images and basically hole punch things or draw. I mean, I was going like, "Fuck, that's so much cooler than you know that picture that was nothing a second ago." Now, because of the layers and the shit that I've done to it, now is so much more interesting because you know. And and I and people said to me, "Well, maybe you feel you can't get it in the moment." It's like, well, yeah, I probably didn't, but I saw something was there that I needed later by shooting that building. 
building by itself is nothing, but by the act of me taking the picture of the building and then doing this to it, now it's something that, that I saw in my head. Absolutely. Yes. Now, you were talking about materials too, though. So like, do you, like, it's gonna sound silly, but like, do you care about like archival materials? Is that even a concern for you? I, I, I know the word. I looked up the definition once. So. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I think the first exhibition I ever did, I used to print years ago, I dated a girl and she printed for Deborah Turberville. There was a process that Deborah Turberville did and I was fascinated by it. And of course, my work never looked like Deborah Turberville, but I liked what the paper did. And it was using this kind of, this graphic arts paper and, and, it, and it would do this just fucked up stuff. Like you had to shoot negatives toward the point. Shooting negatives to be able to print. And this stuff means later on in life, you're probably not gonna be able to print the fucking negatives because they were, they were you know, they had to be shot in a certain way. But the images that came from it were kind of cool. And I did a whole thing, a whole bunch of pictures and, this gallery said they wanted to do a show of them. And then when I showed them what the paper, I showed them the prints and they were like, well, what's this on? And I go, well, this is a plasticky paper. And I was like, yeah, and she goes, well, how archival is it? And I go, I have no idea. Well, we can't, we couldn't ever sell these. And I was like, okay, <laughs> like, well, you know, it's like, I don't know what to say to you. It's like, I mean, you know, I, I imagine when, when my film was being processed and, I, and my work was being printed by Silverworks in New York, I would imagine everything was the utmost the meticulous points of what the negatives and everything should be. I mean, they were all numbered and they were like, it was amazing what they did with my negatives. But I even look at some of my journals going like, it's the glue I'm using gonna actually stay stick that long. Is it, is it one day gonna pick up a book and all the pages and it's like, just like fall out in the ground, you know? And, and I, have a, I have a vault in town that has all my, my best negatives in it. It's this high end, like it's a high end of a closet. Most people have like rooms and I have a little closet that I have all my, my favorite negatives in. It's at a certain temp, you have to wear a jacket when you're in there and there's a certain temperature it's in there and you walk in and there's like, when you walk in there's a vapor barrier, when you walk in the hole, you can hear the whole thing suck the air and how it goes into, it's kind of fascinating. But I figured I, I should put stuff away and I keep, I keep a set of drives there. So if I, you know, for, you know, for just to have someplace else in case anything goes wrong here, it's kind of funny. That's the only thing I do probably that it's like, but then I, I was going to take my journals there and the guy who owned the place looked at me and he said, I don't know how the glue is going to handle the cold. He goes, the glue may, it might separate everything you're doing. So I've been debating about taking a bunch of stuff, just making a book of glue and sticking it in there and seeing what happens over a certain amount of time. Wait, okay, hold on. I'm fascinated. There's a place that, that like, is this a company that just yeah. like does storage yeah. for? Is it storage for music? I was going to say for... music, motion pictures, and yeah. photography. No motion picture that I know. It's all mostly photography and anything you have that, that is sensitive. They have a whole cryo thing also. They have a cryogenic thing, not for people, but for film and stuff. But they have the music libraries of a couple different labels that are, and you, when you go there, they play the music uh, that's basically kept there over the speakers, just kind of fun. And the guy who owns it is like, is amazing. I mean, he's, he, he was the first guy I think I ever saw that had like a Tesla, you know, and he, and he had a charging station in the thing, but you pull in and like, you have to have it, you have to have the pass, the pass to get in, the password to get in or the thing in your car and, and the door opens up and you pull in, there's like four or five slots. And then you go, then you have to, punch your name in then you go into that set of doors and you punch your name and you go through the next set of doors and then you go into where you are and then yours has its own little code and the you know the doors open up and you and it's just uh it's where you keep your stuff yeah and it's it's like it's but i mean he makes a joke saying it'll basically survive an apocalypse you know it's like pretty much like if all the city you know because there's like if it was a fire there's all these things that go off that basically suck all the air out you wouldn't want to get stuck in there if there was a fire i don't think no but that's a fascinating industry in and of itself. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it was necessary. I mean, it was kind of one of those things I found out about. It. It's it's my little, it's the, my probably one expenditure I have outside of my world that I that I spend. It's like having a little apartment, I guess. Like a, like a, the old days apartment. Not like, a, it's not like a thousand dollar a month, but it's, uh, it's, you know, I think it's like about five, 500 a month that I spend just keeping these, that they're safe. Well, I'm happy to know that that you're keeping those safe. <laughs> but it, but it's funny because about a month, a couple of months back, I decided. I mean, over pandemic, I decided that I had way too many. I had a whole room of binders, and I was just like, "This is ridiculous. I don't need to have all this stuff." So I just flushed it. I had like, and I put everything in. I mean, I 
I went through and I said, what of this shoot do I need to keep? And then I narrow it down to this and I put it to that and I took the rest and I threw it into the garbage. And then I had a, a shredder come to the house and I shredded negatives. Like they basically took them in these bins and they put them in and you could see them all going through the shred. It was just, it was like, it was so, re- it had such a weight off my shoulder that I didn't have to worry about like what I was going to fucking do and all this stuff. Or because the amount of stuff that I shot back in the day that was, that was really not important and not interesting and not like anything I really cared about, but I know. And the look on your face is exactly how everyone looked at me when I did it. My agent even looked at me. She was like, you did keep everything. And she goes, well, I kept something from everything, but I didn't want everything anymore. Admittedly, it is a, a it's a double edged sword, because like on the one hand, you want to keep everything for your legacy or for posterity or whatever. But on the other hand, like you have to have physical space or money to be able to be basically just like continually maintain this stuff for the rest of your existence. And that's yeah. a burden in and of itself as well. I mean, I go back to thinking that I probably still don't have pictures that I shot because back in the day you sent the, you know, you didn't send a print, you sent the Chrome to a magazine and then you would only hope that they would send it back one day. And I, I remember I think it was about, I don't know, I want to say about 12 years ago, I got a, I got this box from Condé Nast and it was all these negatives, all these chromes that I'd sent and prints that I'd sent to them for different magazines. And somebody suddenly probably just got tired of keeping it in storage. And I said, well, can we find this guy and send him back his pictures, you know? And, and I totally forgotten, you know, I totally forgotten that I, you know, that they were there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a fascinating like thing about just like the longevity of things, keeping things. How much do you keep? How much do you get rid of? Like, because I, I, you know, when I was younger, I, and don't get me wrong, most of this stuff was shit. But like when I was younger, I used to do this like annual bonfire where I would literally just burn extra. Yeah. Usually it was like, you know, like I had my gallery prints and it was like the one that wasn't quite perfect that I would never exhibit. I'll, I'll burn those. But like we as collectors, like we keep so much. <laughs> Too much. Yeah. We're hoarders. I mean, photographers in general are hoarders. And now it's even worse because, you know, you can have 30,000 images on this little drive. And even that's too much. Like I've gone through and flushed drives out and just said like, I don't need to. I mean, every time I shoot a movie poster, or TV advertising, you're basically shooting close to 6,000 images. I don't need all those pictures. And the majority of them I can't do anything with afterward anyways, because I, I mean, so I narrow down to what I want to keep just to kind of, if I need to say to somebody, oh, I shot this or I shot that, these are my favorite pictures I shot of that. And then even personal stuff, I, if I shoot, you know, I, I, I'll cut it down to a quarter of it and then throw the rest away. You know, I try to always think about like going like back on it and saying like, I know how my brain changes. I know how, but it, at this age, I know the arc of what I will end up going back to and what I'll use at this point, but there's nothing perfect about it. There's not, I mean, I, I, I probably have thrown things away. I shouldn't have thrown away, but say la vie. These days, you know, so like we've talked a lot about your, your past, but like these days, how do you feel about like like social media and the website and stuff? Because you said it, you said at one point that it, it did really great wonders for you, the internet and social media and all this. So like, what's your relationship with that? How do you like it? How do you feel about it? It's a double edged sword. I'll go back to your analogy about something earlier. I don't. I didn't do Facebook. Instagram was great because I was able just to kind of post things in general. I, I only followed, I mean, I didn't follow a lot of photographers because people just are not posting. I wanted to see beyond what just, I mean, it's okay to put pictures on, like I'll put pictures on th- of projects I've worked on, but I try to keep it away from that. I try to keep it to more the point of things I shot. I even, I post a lot of what I shoot with the camp with, with the phone, because I think it's good to kind of see how photographers' brains are working. So I kind of like seeing, or things they're working on that they wouldn't normally, you're not going to see anyplace else. Like I put a lot of personal work on it. I had a journal site on it, but Instagram took it down. They didn't like it. So they, they took it away from me. I went to Instagram court. I mean, I could have gone to Instagram court to get it back. And I said, it wasn't worth it. But I find it sad because I think that Instagram should be, there should be nothing that's wrong. I mean, the whole thing of like, if you have anything suggested of sexuality is like, is taken off is like 
there are levels of that, but the stuff they yank down half the time is I saw a butt crack or I saw a nipple or I saw it's like really uh, to clarify a female nipple, not a male nipple. Yeah, male nipples are fine, you know. Yeah. Male pubic hair is probably fine. God knows male butt cracks are fine. It's just all about the about the female body, which seems to and I and I think it's also bullshit that one person can decide if it's wrong or not. One person decides and they go, I I didn't like this picture. You know what? You didn't like it? Stop following me. How's that sound? Go someplace else. When did we did one person become the the orator or the or the decider of what is good and bad for the rest of us? It's so sad. It's like if somebody likes my work and they and 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 they want to look at stuff, and if they don't like something, then great, then don't like it, move on. If it's continually stuff you don't like, then don't follow me, right? But don't then make it a point in your life to tell to tell everyone else they can't look at it. I mean, that is the bullshit. So that's the sad part of social media. It was amazing the high point of that would it be that more people have seen my work now have more more that has a wider point to that so there's no more magazines so now if i post up on here you know i mean and i don't even have a lot of followers compared to most people that are like photographers of my age or my my level my success or whatever they call that he's doing air quotes just because yeah, it's like that. whatever the success is i have but when i did the show in stockholm the, the amount of people that tagged me and, and or DM'd me was amazing. And these aren't people that I know. And they are people, I mean, I had somebody say, say, I saw this show, it's amazing. And then I tried doing, every single time someone did like looked at it, I tried to say, thanks for going. I mean, I went back through as much as I possibly could and said, thanks for going. Thanks for posting it. Thanks, it's so amazing. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And then when I responded to one person, they said, yes, I came all the way from Spain just to see your work. But knowing that is humbling beyond belief. I mean, that somebody actually physically said to themselves, I need to go see this. I'm, and I've done that for exhibitions. So to feel that I inspired someone that they needed to go look at something like that, that was to me unbelievable. I mean, I was, you know, completely floored. So the constant people reaching out saying they saw the show, that was really exciting. And it would have never happened if I didn't have social media. No one's going to handwrite me a note and saying, just went and saw your show. You know, it's kind of like, you know, that's, that would be, that would be unbelievable if that happened. You know, that would be kind of really great, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. So, but beyond that, it, I think it's opened people up to enjoying photography more because there's so much more photography out there. I think it's not been the death of photography as everyone says. I think it's, it, it is, it is exciting to see people get a little more, like they look at photography differently you know, not everything is perfect. I wish someone would start an, an Instagram account, not Instagram, but a photo or a creative account that people could join into and that there weren't any rules to it. And, and you couldn't complain. And, you know, you couldn't even like or dislike. It just, you went to it to look at stuff. I, it's probably what's called, um, was it Pinterest? It's probably is what that is. I was going to say Tumblr. Or Tumblr, right? Yeah, it's it's hard. I mean, because like it, to a certain extent, like the rules and regulations that social media has placed on sharing of art, period, whether it's paintings or whatever, is it, it, it's sort of skewing the reality because now people are thinking that nobody's doing these kinds of like nudes or erotics or any sort of other sort of things because they just don't see them, you know, on their right. social media. And so I, I feel like it's, separating us in a, in a certain way because like i don't understand it because unfortunately they put these puritanical american guidelines of like no nipples no butt cracks no all this kind of crap and and I, i'm not a fan like part of the reason why i left america is because i don't like all that puritanical crap but and yeah. i don't like republican ethos and there are lots of other reasons <laughs> oh it's only gotten more special since you've left so it's <laughs> I'm aware of it. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it, it, you know, in Europe, it's so liberal. I mean, fuck, I was walking down the street today and I was like, you know what? I love living in a city where there's a advertisement on the side of a bus for a vibrator. Yeah. Yeah. Or you go on late night television and, and where people can speak, say what they want and they can say, you know, salty language on television if they want to, you know? And I mean, I, I, I love, there's a show in England the dating show where you basically it's five people who are naked and they, and you pick out the person and then they, I, it's like, what, what it's stupid, but you know what, who cares? It's just a human body. 
you know what I mean? It's not like somebody's physically having sex. I mean, that's a very different conversation and, and how that is more offensive than somebody blowing someone's brains out is still beyond like how you think that's disturbing and that that's not disturbing. It's like, I don't even know what to say to people anymore. I mean, and I, I, I agree with you. My wife and I several times kind of look at them like, why are we living here still in America? Well, see, like part of it for me is this, like, because I, I've gone back and forth with this in, a, in, let's say the United States, just as an example, because we're both from there, the, I don't care too much if politics, literal politics, like the government gets involved because quite honestly, I can vote those people out. Right. So like, so, okay, fine. Republicans come into power. I don't like what they would say. I will go out of my way to make sure they don't stay in power. But something like social media, these are people that I didn't vote into power to make these decisions and I cannot vote them out of power either. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, I, and I think that it's like the thing when you basically are, when you, when you choose to say, I'm offended by this, right. You should have to say who you are. And I think if you, if you basically are looking at someone's site and you are offended by something that immediately should be by the act of you saying that means that you can't look at the site anymore. You are removed from that site. You don't get to stick around again and basically keep judging the person. I don't think that's fair. I think that's all bullshit. It's like you're not hurting anybody by showing a nipple. You know what I mean? If you're worried your child's going to be upset by the nipple that's on my website, then then don't let them look at it. Be a parent. I mean, I think the, being being a parent anymore is everyone. No one wants to be a parent anymore. They all want to leave it on somebody. It's it's someone else's fault that 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 their child does this this and this. And and the, all the kids I know that my son grew up around that kind of all the ones that are guarded like that are the most fucked up as adults because they haven't been allowed to basically just you know go out and see and do and and making everything dirty or or wrong or whether it be drugs and alcohol and sex. It's like. I mean, the big, the big awful things in life, not the point of going out and buying a gun and shooting, you know, going out on the weekend and shooting a rifle all weekend or needing to get your semi-automatic weapon going. It's like, it's just, I don't know. It is, it's a very hard thing sometimes to kind of see some of this stuff and go like, yeah, it's about what we're living in the middle of, so. Yeah, I mean, I went and did a, a workshop with Jock Sturges at his naturalist community in the South of France. Yeah. And I was scared. I give you a lot of credit because he asked me about coming, and I was like, "I'm not sure I can walk around. I'll kind of be part of that for a couple of days." But yeah, so you went. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Had and I had to be naked while photographing these naked people for a mm. week, and mm-hmm. it was it was scary, like the first day. But literally within 24 hours, it was just nope. Didn't even notice it really. Like it was amazing. And to be honest. I would be interested in like bringing up my children going to naturalist communities because like I had, I didn't understand it from the outside, but like once exper- once I've experienced it, I'm sort of like, oh God, it makes so much sense because like some of these girls, they were like 15, 16, 17, and they had the most positive outlooks about their physical bodies like none of them necessarily were like you know stunning model beautiful you know anything but they had the most they were comfortable they were so comfortable and they were so self uh like not self-conscious about it like it was amazing and i i was i'm i have a greater appreciation for that entire community because of it yeah i didn't realize that because it was funny because i i'd known jock for a bit and then i i still do and then he he, he was telling me, he goes, you got to come to my, to my workshop. I really want you to come to my workshop. I'd love to see, because, you know, I just come up with this one idea that I shoot this one time a day and this is what the light is. And he goes, you, you, you got, you create these things. And, and we were talking about it and he said, I'd love to see what you do if you came. And I was like, yeah, but I, I can't get past the point of walking around naked. I mean, I'm just not that comfortable in my body at all i wish i was i promise you you can actually yeah i probably can i just you know I'm, as i even get older i'm just more like eh, you know i mean i don't really care anymore what i look like i mean i've kind of given up on the worries of trying to make this look any better than it does so uh, it, and it is what it is so it's like you know but wait i'm interested wait you had a problem with instagram because what you were showing nudes i have no idea i they, they never gave me any reason or anything it was my journal page so it was all my art stuff it was called fwo3 journals and it was all 
journals and stuff I drew and painted on. And my wife a couple times would look at me and she'd say like, you know, this, do you think this isn't going to get pulled down? And I go, I don't know. We'll see what happens. You know, just one day it was gone. It just like, literally there was no warning. There was no like anything. And I started to research it a bit and they said I was in Instagram jail. And, and I asked a friend of mine, uh, this, there's a girl who's a great photographer and uh, was a, is, is a great muse, like Shelby Diamond. I know Shelby, yeah. Yeah, she's great. And she, she told me because she's had to go through it quite a bit, but hers is more bullshit on her end because, you know, she walked away from the Jehovah Witness and all those people keep coming at her and complain about her site. They didn't look, they don't, they don't, you know, and, and no one bothers to check it. They just basically say, oh, well, that person, a couple people complain about you. You're done. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, it was like I was watching the, the, the Get Back Beatles thing. And when they finally went up on the roof and they were playing, within the first song they sang, you know, people were collecting in the street and the police show up. And they said, we've had 30 complaints of a noise problem. 30? If you go on the street, there's a hundred people in the street who think it's amazing. So you want to weigh that out? Is it that just so the act of 30 people are going to basically stop you from doing something? And, and this is just, you know, one or two people have to complain about it. And that's all this is. I mean, it's all, it's never, people's whole lives are destroyed now just by the simple act of someone saying, you did this. You know what I mean? And you're like, did I, can we have a conversation about that? Can you really? And, and so your word is more important than my word. So that's what I would have I know a, a young lady, a Russian artist, that she had like 190,000 followers on her Instagram page. And somebody, one person complained and they took down her whole site. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you, so 193,000 people say yes. Yeah. And one person says no. And it's gone. Like it, it's a little bit of like pandering to the lowest common denominator in many ways. Well, everyone's fear, but it's funny. It's funny how Facebook finds that they can't, that, that fear is something they can't. They don't seem to process it with other places, but for Instagram, they basically shit all over people pretty quickly in the sense of you're, you're taking that one voice. I think I really truly believe if you're offended by something, you don't get to basically, you know, unless it's something, it's, it's violent or it's something that's basically, that's, that's going to be harmful. Yeah, I get that, right? But Agreed. complain about seeing a woman's nipple or anything or a, a nude body, male or female, I think it's bullshit that, that somebody, if you don't like it, then don't look at it. This whole thing of all of a sudden that these policing of the, uh, that we're, we're policing ourselves and the lowest common denominator is basically being able to take us all out. It's like, you know, thank God for like streaming television because it's like you, you, they, you know, no one, you can't take, you they can't complain about it. If you don't like it, go to the next thing. That's, that's what it should be. You don't want to watch. You don't want to watch romantic comedies, and you want to watch your violent programming. Or if you want to watch Squid Games, and you don't want to watch Downton Abbey, it's like who fucking cares? It's like it's what you like. It's like there, it, it, we can't all be the same. We can't all be put in this little shelf, going like this is what you now can accept in society, and this is how you have. I mean, I don't believe in hate speak, but it's like at the same point, everyone has a right to say what they want. It's just 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 know who they are at that point, like. I posted things during the whole Trump era and I had a lot of people go at me and say, you know, what did they say to me? Stick to your little pictures and your glue and your paint and your, and your drawings and stop politicking. And I would be like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> you know, maybe you should go follow somebody else. You know, I didn't do a lot of it, but I did a little of it. All right. Let's try and wrap this up. Let's go to a positive note in some way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have any sort of like last, I guess the idea would be, do you have any sort of, uh, advice or encouragements for people getting into the photo industry or the fine art industry depending on how you want to tilt it um these days i think it's like any time to be honest there is no rhyme or reason as i've said before of why anyone gets chosen i think what you if you if you create art that is true to yourself and and you really are just not trying to basically pander to anybody if you're creating something toward the basically of, of, of showing somebody what your vision is. People see that more honestly than you trying to be somebody else just to fit, just to fit the mold kind of thing. And that to me has been how people get noticed more and more and more. You know what I mean? Cause the industry is very different. I mean, I have no idea how you'd start anymore in the industry. Cause my, my beginnings were basically going to magazines and dropping off a portfolio and hoping someone would give you a quarter page picture. No more magazines. You know what I mean? And, you know, 
and young photographers have to get noticed by the act of just getting someone to kind of like pick you out. That's why all these Instagram photographers are becoming big because that's the only place you're seeing work anymore. If you can basically constantly post pictures on your site and get people to look at your work and get followers and get that. I mean, it's kind of sad. That's what's how this is all happening. But, you know, and then now with social media, you can send people stuff. So if you can send, if you find people you want to work for or work with, you need just to send them work. Just, you know, DM them and say, hey, I did this picture or hey, or email them or whatever. You know, it's like, it's the best you can do anymore. So it's hard. I have, I have no, otherwise I have just, it just creating for yourself is the most important thing. And then people kind of are, are kind of, kind of move toward that. And they get excited by it. Well, thank you very much. This has been an honor and a privilege to talk with you. So, well, thanks thank for you. having me. This is so great. No, it was, it was a lot of fun. I'm glad we were able to figure out the timing on it and we able to do this. Thanks again. And uh, yeah, give, give Jack a shout. We'll trade prints. Ooh, so exciting. <laughs> oh, be fun. Be fun. Get study, so. Okay. Thank you for listening all the way to the end of the episode. Please be sure to tell your friends, your coworkers, your family, anybody that has any interest in the arts or the creative process, because part of the reason for the podcast is to try and make it so that everybody can do their creative endeavors easier, better, more effectively, without as many difficulties and problems and mistakes that I made in my career. Uh, I hope you all can do better than I did. So please be sure to tell all your friends, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We are produced by 5014, and the audio was edited by Mickey at Cush Audio Services. And the music was created by Pete Bybee. The Wise Fool is supported in part by an EEA grant from Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway in an effort to work together for a green, competitive, and inclusive Europe. We would also like to thank our partners Hunt Kastner in Prague, Czech Republic, and Kunst Centrene i Norge in Norway. Links to EEA grants and our partner organizations are available in the show notes or on our website wisefoolpod.com.